I'm going to work hard not to get the bell here, so uh, we'll just move on. But uh, the other reason I can do that is uh, because I feel like I'm summing up a lot of presentations, particularly what we heard today. Jamie Penn did a really nice job of framing things up, and Lisa's added in some numbers, and uh, Ross's comments on uh, Ukraine fit in very well. What I want to do is spend some time just talking a little bit more about the economics in, in, in what's happening with competition and what we have to deal with. And I know on the front end it's going to sound a little bit uh, negative, but I can assure you there are responses that we have that we can do. Uh, and to Ross's point, you know, we got to take advantage of the time frame here for us really to try to uh, go after it. But I do think there's a number of things that we can do. So first of all, I just want to show you what ocean freight costs are. The Baltic Dry Index is just a good indicator of dry bulk costs. And, and when we talk about Ukraine, uh, we talk about Black Sea, and Ross went through the uh, production costs and everything. The other thing I want to add into that is that over the last couple years, we've watched the cost of ocean freight drop 80%. It's taken out a cost of 20 to 25 dollars a ton of moving Ukrainian wheat uh, into the Asian marketplace. Uh, the costing right now, if I give you a, just a good example, is uh, I can ship Russian wheat uh, to Indonesia cheaper than I can ship grain from the Swan Hill District uh, to Melbourne Port. And we haven't even taken it to Indonesia yet. So that's the big issue that we have going on. Uh, right now, we can get Russian wheat landed into Egypt for about $35 a ton cheaper than Australian wheat. And I know we talk a lot about Asia, but the Middle East is a very important market for us. It's been roughly 30 35% of our exports. So, so we're losing uh, a strong economic uh, advantage as we walk into uh, those different areas. Uh, crude oil price is a big part of this, and it's affecting the cost of uh, ocean freight, but the other component of ocean freight is is that we've watched capacity increase the last four years, and a lot of it has to do with the supermax vessel, they call it, uh, that's being designed to handle the new Panama canals. Uh, typically, when you bring in these new freighters and you have this production come on, they're running 8 to 10 percent cheaper uh, in costings, but with crude oil this low, and the other thing is with iron ore prices, steel prices so low, scrap metal is very cheap that a lot of the what we call overaged or overage vessels typically would be scrapped and they're staying uh, in operation. So we got this big glut of, of uh, vessel capacity right now, which for us sitting down in Australia uh, is an issue for us, uh, particularly if we're shipping to uh, the Middle East. So then we talk about the price of wheat. Wheat falling about 50 percent relative to uh, U.S. dollar. And, and again, it's about the economics. I just went through what's happening on ocean freight. Uh, Ross went through, when you look at the economics, uh, taking the Black Sea as an example, and there's other areas as well that with the price coming down, what that ends up happening is that has to get pushed back on the Australian farmer because they're the ones that are dealing with the, the lower price on a global basis, but they're also dealing with the higher competition from, uh, coming, coming from other areas. And so it gets reflected down into the price uh, of what an Australian farmer is paying, uh, being paid for wheat. So when I do look at the, the growth in wheat production, uh, and Ross, he, he uh, touched on quite a bit of it on the, uh, the Black Sea side, uh, but there's a number of things that go in there, and I spent a lot of time in my uh, previous career dealing with production in the Black Sea as well as exporting out of there. And just a little application of capital and, and better farming practices would lead in a period of three years a 40% jump in yield. And so now you look at this where capital is cheap, it's a wash around the world, you got crude oil prices lower. In places like the Black Sea, even though their, their currency is getting weaker, they're not seeing their input costs go up because they produce nitrogen there. They have phosphate there. And so what it's doing is making it more efficient and, and phenomenally more profitable for them to continue to improve uh, their uh, production levels. And by using practices we have in other places, it helps improve their yield as well. And again, that, that foreign capital is finding its way into those areas. So this is what we're having to deal with. But it's not just Black Sea. You'll notice Europe also has shown some increased numbers, and you saw those earlier this morning. And then if I put into that, looking at the wheat carryout, uh, a lot of the places have benefited from some very stable, good production, where Australia has kind of leveled off and in the last couple of years, I would say, have not been normalized crop sizes. And so the net result is, uh, not only is our, our production leveling, but our wheat carryout is going down. And so when you look at it in terms of price, it's overall supply. It's what you carry in from the year plus what you produce really makes a difference and matters. 
And this is where Europe is really creating issues for us uh, and really becoming very competitive in the marketplace. Uh, I can just tell you, we just recently traded a German wheat cargo uh, into the Philippines, and we're able to land it there for about $8 a ton better than we could take Australian in there. So this is not just a Black Sea phenomenon. It's also happening uh, from, from different areas as well. And I just wanted to highlight on the currency base, because a lot's been talked about the, the weaker Australian dollar, and there's no question. Uh, when I arrived uh, uh, in 2014, it was uh, sitting at 94 cents uh, to a U.S. dollar. Now we're sitting at 71, 72. But the, the big change was pretty dramatic in that first six to 12 months I was here. In the last 12 months, Australian dollar is down 8%, but I just want to show you against the competing nations that we have how much their currencies have dropped even more. So the one next to it is Argentina, dropped 43 percent. Part of it was just the recent 25 percent drop uh, as you had the new government come in, but it was already declining and coming down. So guess what? Argentine wheat now is being exported, and we're having to compete against that as well. So it's a new competitor in the marketplace. European Union is down 5 percent, so they've been tracking uh, with us uh, on the Australian dollar. Uh, the Russian ruble is down 19% versus our 8%. The Canadian dollar is tracking with us down 8%. Uh, Ukrainian hervenia is down 16%. So we're actually losing ground against a lot of our competitors on the currency uh, exchange. I'm not sure it's going to change that much uh, more uh, in terms of how we go forward, but it's created a relative advantage for them. And particularly, if I go back to uh, a number of those countries, so if I look at the Black Sea as an example, uh, you have a situation where their input costs are not being reflected in uh, going up in price because they're, they're insulated from the currency exchange because they produce their own inputs. Or if I look at Brazil, it's the same thing. Uh, they have nitrogen, they have phosphates, they've got their crude oil. Uh, so they're not experiencing uh, the big um, uh, uplift in prices on input that you would expect uh, just because of the changes in the currencies. So where does that uh, bring us? Um, you know, again, it sounds pretty negative because it's, it's pretty strong headwinds that we're facing right now trying to keep Australian farmers competitive in the marketplace. And there's a number of things that we can do and that we need to take a look at. But uh, the issue is that if we're going to help farmers increase their yield so we participate in this growth, particularly in the Asian region, we've got to find ways to improve the pricing tool. And if we're going to attract capital into our business, uh, we have to find ways to improve the returns. And, and so that means we've got to find ways to, to reduce our costs and bring them down, and we have to find ways to not try to compete in, 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 the, in the pricing uh, aspect of the marketplaces. Uh, we're not going to increase our yields enough and our production enough uh, to feed that, that bread basket or, or feed the Asian uh, uh, basket, but we can certainly participate it. Uh, with it with a little bit of increase, but also just understanding what things can we do differently. So I just want to talk through those uh, a little bit. So I've got three areas that I would really concentrate on. Uh, the first one, supply chain does matter. Ross showed us our costing is $30 a ton higher. Uh, I know there's another breakout session talking about supply chains, but if I just go and look at our supply chains, we've got a number of things that are going on. We've had underinvestment uh, for a number of years uh, which has created some inefficiencies, and we have to deal with the fact that we have some of the highest labor costs in our supply chain uh, relative to our competitors, and those are the two issues that we got to deal with. And so that's why uh, Grain Corp's been working on that. That's why we've been trying to uh, put investments in upwards of $200 million, trying to improve the efficiency of supply chains. One way of doing it is by getting more on rail, and we think we can take 5 $6 a ton out of it. But the other aspect of it is, is changing our supply chain, trying to find ways to take the labor cost out, but then also increase value for the farmer, having more segregation so we can pay them for the quality that they bring in. Uh, we, we paper blend their, their uh, qualities so that they have an opportunity to work on efficiencies and not worry about trying to blend on farm. Those are some parts that we work on, but labor is a huge issue. So if I give you an example, we just uh, finished building a, uh, a new facility uh, up country in uh, Colleen. And that facility handled 115,000 tons this harvest. It did it with one permanent employee and seven casuals. Our traditional facility that handles 100,000 ton is going to have 20 to 25 people. So it's one third the labor cost. 
And then we start looking at, if we rationalize down some sites, then our labor costs, labor costs actually improve dramatically. And the big thing is making sure we keep performing for the farmer. So they may have to drive a longer distance, but what we're finding out, they get more turns in during the day because we're more efficient, we're dumping them faster, and we're paying them more for the quality of the grain. So, so that's one big area that we can work on. The other one is not just in the grain supply chain, but in the overall food supply chain. And case in point is uh, we, we crush uh, canola, and we produce edible oils, and we produce uh, margarines. Uh, we're just going through a project where we have uh, shut down one of our, in the process of shutting down one of our refiners and combining it down into a more of a hyper plant situation down in Melbourne. And that does a couple things for us. Puts us closer to the canola production, puts us closer to the dairy demand for the meal, puts us closer to exporting our product out and where the food business is. And what it's done is taken out $20 a ton on the supply chain. And we haven't done anything different outside of the fact rearranged our facilities, and yes, we are getting uh, labor improvements as well. But those are the type of things we need to work on as we look at uh, supply chains. Uh, the second one uh, that I would talk about, and it has been talked about over the last two days, and that's really working on your customer offerings, and that is Australia's competitive advantage is we are uh, green and clean. We have the ability to trace production. We have the ability to fine-tune what it is our customers want uh, and, and, and really service them, not so much about here's what we got, but here's, uh, we're listening to you and we can provide for you. So just a couple, couple points I would make is, uh, if I look at a lot of our uh, barley demand that we supply into Japan, uh, we actually have our customers coming out on the paddock. They're going through the whole process of production. They're watching the agronomics coming on. They're helping dictate the type of uh, varieties that they want. Uh, so um, one of our Japanese customers uh, produces choshu. And uh, choshu is a uh, distilled barley product from a pearled barley. But it requires a certain type of variety. Uh, and it's something that has to have the quality. And then we have to spread out the, the production area so we get diversity of uh, supply. Um, but that is a huge benefit because it translates back to what we pay the farmer. Our, our chochu barley variety contracts typically run $50 to $60 a ton higher than a regular barley contract. Its input costs are the same price. And so those are the things that we, gotta, we just got to keep looking for, and we got to keep listening uh, to what our customers are saying. Um, I'll use infant formula. That's been brought up a little bit the past uh, couple, couple days as well. Uh, I'm sure a, a lot of you don't know, but infant formula, 25% of it is edible oils by weight. Uh, and that's something that we also work on is the blend of oils. We've taken our refiner plant, we've turned it into a food plant. Um, all you see is stainless steel out there. Our customers are able to come in and take a look at that. We can blend very specific type of blends. I can tell you a lot of the blends we do are five different type of oils. Uh, and we can identity preserve it. We can make it sustainable type of supplies because uh, that's what the customer wants. If you go over and you look in China and you walk into a supermarket, uh, you're going to see shelves lined with infant formula. And underneath them, you're going to see flags of origin. And they're going to stick out. And we're competing against Ireland and Switzerland and the Netherlands. And you have Australia and New Zealand. But all of those products are trading for double the price of what a Chinese product is being produced. And matter of fact, you get even more for it if you can it uh, in Australia instead of shipping the ball product over in Canning and in China. And, and I'm sure you've heard the stories and, and seen them that uh, people are actually selling them online and, and if they have a receipt that they bought it in Australia, uh, it's like a certificate of origin uh, and it trades at a premium beyond itself. So those are the type of markets that Australia really does have that competitive advantage. I mean, we have the system in place, we can do traceability, we have farmers that already are well on their way to to uh, producing uh, sustainable products. I mean, those are the type of things that we really got to go after, and we really have to try to find a way um, to make sure that we capture the premium markets and not just fight ourselves into the price-based markets. And finally, um, we as a country have to get more transformational uh, when we look at agriculture. This is about keeping Australia competitive in the marketplace, and so we have to keep looking for things that we can do that are transformational. Uh, and I guess it would be uh, 
not appropriate. If I just didn't mention, that's one of the issues that we're looking at and why we got involved with AGC, is we're trying to find ways to be transformational. The proposal that's being put in front of CBH is really trying to do that. What it's trying to do is free up capital so it can go to a farmer so they can make the investments that Wade has talked about. And in the meantime, freeing up CBH as an organization to make sure it has ways to efficiently use its capital and take it doing things on a grander scale. Because like it or not, scale does matter. Our international customers are consolidating, and so to stay relevant to our international customers, you gotta operate at scale, and you gotta have diversified supplies. And, and so that's what we're looking at uh, when we got involved. But the primary point is, it's the WA growers' decision. They're the ones that will decide what they want to do, and that's a decision that we respect and we accept, uh, but we certainly think there's a lot of positive reasons uh, for that proposal to go through. So let me just, uh, uh, just sum up and, uh, and just go back again. I think there's three areas. In other words, we've got to invest and improve our supply chains, we've got to specialize for our customers and treat them all differently, and we've got to look for transformational and innovative solutions. And those are the three things I think that we can do. And as Ross says, uh, it's now is the time to do it uh, because we've got a little window of opportunity to make sure that we stay competitive. Thank you.